Okay, I think this should be fun. So I just wanted to kind of go over kind of how we ended off last time. We uh, we set up everything in RabbitMQ. We did some load balancing. We kind of went through that. We created a request. One of the things that didn't work in the last one was the benchmarking that we wanted to do. So you know, we can see that the service is probably not up and running right now. I probably have to go start it. Let's go ahead and get this started as well. So what we have is a service where we can submit an order and the backend process through RabbitMQ is now processing that order request. So we have our submit order queue. Submit order queue has one consumer on it right now, which is running in this service. And if I go to the Swagger UI and execute it, you'll see I get the 200 back and that we received the message over here in our service. So one of the things we tried to do last time that wasn't working is actually see the traffic under load. So finally got Apache Bench working. I had to go to the non-SSL endpoint because for some reason it doesn't trust the certificate. So now I'm going to go through and I'm going to post a whole bunch of requests. Looks like 10,000 with a concurrency level of 10. And we're going to see the activity over here in RabbitMQ. So it's going to start up. So we've done 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And again, this is RabbitMQ running with a single core in a Docker container. So not exactly a very large instance of RabbitMQ by any stretch of the imagination. When I run this with RabbitMQ on my local Mac, the numbers are significantly higher, but that's not the purpose of this broadcast today. It's really just to kind of show how everything works. So you can see in the overview, Publish request per second, we were getting about a thousand a second, which considering we're in a little Docker container, that's probably not a bad deal. 95% of our requests were less than 28 milliseconds. Our 98th, 99th percentiles were 31 and 36 milliseconds. And that's for the full round trip request response. Because as you can see, we're doing the post version. So this is going to be the less than super fast version. I didn't try this, and of course, the last time I tried to do things on the fly like this, it, it went completely sideways. But what happens if I change this to the put, to where this does, dang it. If I change this to the put, like the zero, and it doesn't wait, I wonder how fast it'll be this time. I don't know if it'll be any different. It's just calling send, so theoretically it should just be a lot quicker, but maybe not, I don't know. Oh, it looks like it was quicker. So before our 98th percentile was 31, now our 98th percentile is 20. That's what we do like 100 concurrent requests at a time. Again, going sideways, might go crazy. Oh, you can see we're sitting at about 910 publishes a second. Because these are puts, they aren't expecting responses. So let's see what happens here. Did they all pass? Completed requests. So we had 10,000 completed, zero failed. Looks like our 98th percentile went up a little bit. Looks like we were probably queuing on the ASP.NET process. So if we actually crank this down and try not to exceed how many processors we have, let's see what happens if it gets any different. And we're only going to play with this for another second or two before I get tired of messing with it. Also recognize that we are spewing a ton of log messages over here. So that writing to the console probably isn't helping our performance numbers anything now that I think about it. And still, even at that, we're at about 98th percentile with 23 milliseconds. So not horrible, but you know, pretty decent considering the environment that we're in. So anyway, I just wanted to close that out because I know we had talked about Apache Bench and kind of showing how we could you know, load balance that. I wonder what happens if I actually, no, we're done. <laughs> we're not going to sit and benchmark for, you know, the next hour or whatever it ends up being. So we'll go ahead and close that out and call that done. So I have my service running and I have the API. When I left the end last session, I wanted to say that I was going to start talking about sagas and what I've come up with. And again, this was me waking up this morning and thinking this would be a fun thing to do today. So I managed to get the 
OBS software completely installed, configured, got everything set up, figured out a workflow that works, figured an audio system that works. A lot of thanks to Drew, Drew Sellers, his you know, partner in crime, the co-founder of Mass Transit, for helping me get the audio set up and getting it all dialed in, tuned up and worked out because without that, I probably would have some really horrible sounding audio right now. So the OBS software is really easy to use once you completely figure it out, which means watching a lot of YouTube videos on how to set it up and then how to set up things like audio compressors and stuff. So it's been kind of a fun learning experience and uh, definitely give me feedback, you know, either by email, Twitter, whatever, just, you know, how the stream sounds, you know, if any improvements, questions, whatever. This is completely unscripted. I mean, in the 15 minutes between the last session, I figured out what saga we're going to create. So yeah, that that that's kind of how far ahead this is planned. So hopefully it's going well in that respect. You notice the sweater's back on because it's cooling off because the sun is no longer coming through the windows. So yeah, it's been a long day. Yeah, OBS is cool. Yeah, and a kitten cam would be awesome. So I'm just saying. Yeah, the internet needs more cat videos. So I'm going to kill my service here. No need to keep it running. And we're going to go into the code and we're going to start looking at creating the saga. So I'm going to go back into my components. I'm going to create a new directory because I've yeah, got to have some organization here. And we are going to create a state machine saga. So mass transit includes within it. Let's see if I can get the uh, docs up here real quick. Mass Transit supports within the Saga section, you'll see the Automatonomous section. Automatonomous is the state machine that I built for Mass Transit. Now it can be used independently, but it's really designed to be message driven and part of Mass Transit. So previously in the earliest versions of Mass Transit, we only supported consumer sagas. And a consumer saga is really, it looks a lot like a consumer, but you know, it has the consume method with the consume context on it, but that's about it. Everything beyond that, you're you're basically end up having to write yourself. So all the behavior of the saga you have to build from scratch for that saga. And what we found in a lot of the applications we were building is that almost all the time we were tracking the state. And so I built Automatonomous to solve that problem and to give us a completely consistent reusable state machine engine. So with mass transit uh, to automatonomous implementation, the state machine defines the behavior and the state machine instance is the actual data portion of the saga. And the reason that's important is because the data portion is correlated to messages using the correlation ID or other properties. And those properties then match up to the events so when you receive multiple events at the state machine it's correlated by mass transit to the appropriate instance and those instances are kept in a saga repository what's nice about that is you can have tens hundreds of thousands of state machine instances and they're all in disk somewhere they aren't you know eating up memory or eating up a call stack or, or waiting to be executed waiting on remote requests etc so it's actually persistent and stored, which means that it can be distributed. It can be spread out across the machines. So the load is able to be spread out across multiple instances. You know, now the database is obviously going to be the limiting factor. And most of our repositories support both optimistic and pessimistic concurrency. So there's plenty of reading material on here. I've tried to flesh out the documentation as good as I can. I'm going to start with Redis because it was really easy to set up Redis. I just went and added it to my Docker Compose file. So if we look at my um, runtime here, I've added Redis, Redis to the Docker Compose. So I've created a Twitch Redis instance that's up and running. The uh, RabbitMQ is also still running. So let's go back here and we're going to create our state machine. So the state machine that we're going to create, right now we have an API that calls a service to create an order, to submit an order. We're going to add an event called order submitted that will be published by the consumer once it's accepted the order. So let's start off by initially creating the state machine. 
and we are going to call this big shock our order state machine and i'm going to close this off here just to take away some of the noise our order state machine is going to inherit from the mass transit state machine interface and the generic argument that it takes is the state instance so in this case we're going to call it order state we are going to create a type for that states are classes because typically they have to be something that can be written out by something that's going to map a class to the data in this case redis does that for us so we will implement our missing members in this case i'm just going to do get set so each core so the state machine is going to be the behavior the state machine instance is the state that gets persisted to disk and the correlation id is the unique identifier that identifies that saga's instance state so i will define in the constructor oops the correlation ID is there. The other thing that we have to keep track of is the actual state. Because a state machine is about states, we have to keep track of the state. So we will have, and we're just gonna store it as a string for now. We're gonna create a property called current state. And that is gonna be the current state of this saga. Now we need an event. Well, first, we don't have to do anything here. We've, we've got the state figured out, but we'll have to define our states at some point. I'm going to go over to the contracts. I'm going to add a new class here. Or I'm sorry, a new interface. My bad. And this is going to be the order submitted event. The order submitted event is going to have the order ID. And we will probably also have the date time timestamp that the order was submitted. I think we had the customer number in there, so we might as well carry that on with us. And that's all we need for now. I mean, I, I, we could put all the order item lines in there and stuff, but for now, we'll just keep this event pretty simple. And we're going to change the consumer so that it publishes that event once we've accepted the order. So we aren't going to reject the order because we don't want to do that. At this point, we've accept, we're going to accept the order submission. So we're going to say context.publish because events should be published. And we are going to say order submitted. And we are going to initialize that order's properties. Now remember, we're using the mass transit analyzers, so we have a nice Roslyn quick fix in here to add the missing properties. And in this case, we're going to pass basically the exact same things we did here. And the timestamp. Yes, the Roslyn analyzer is is pretty legit. <laughs> We went without it for years and it's like so nice now to just like alt enter and bam, I have it data. So yeah, mad props for that. That that's that's been so nice. I'm like already addicted to it to where I can't even code without it now. And and it's crazy if you have like a rich data type with dictionaries and arrays and everything and then it builds it all out with the defaults. It's just it's insane. Um the initializers are really cool. They do a lot of things. Um they 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 support async, they support type conversion. So if you have ints to bytes, bytes to ints, enums, strings, strings to dates, date times, date times offsets, anything that can be converted. Probably my favorite one is that I could come out here and put like, you know, task string customer equals, you know, task dot from result. And I could just put a string in here and say hello. And I could actually assign customer number instead of doing this, I could just say customer number equals customer. And it's good because it knows that it's going to convert that task of string to customer number, which is going to ultimately be a string. So it like figures it out. And it's pretty, pretty awesome because it does it by name. 
and this doesn't give me an error. Now, if I came in here and put something like, um, well, actually string converts to anything, so it really wouldn't matter. But like if I, uh, let me get this out of here. But if I like said, um, instead of this timestamp, if I said timestamp equals um, a decimal, something that it wouldn't convert from, you'll actually see that I get an error. And it says incompatible type timestamp because it's expecting something that it can convert to a date time and it can't. So therefore it says, hey, that's a problem. But I'm going to go put that back to the timestamp and everything's happy. And it's pretty good. I mean, I went through and looked at all the different types that convert and I think I got them all, but there's probably some weird ones that don't work. So, or that maybe flag incorrectly, but can still be converted. So, and it even includes dictionary keys, array values, everything. So if you have an array of ints and you want to pass it out as an array of strings for the message contract, it will convert into string all the integers for you. So it's, it's pretty fun, pretty powerful. So anyway, now that I'm publishing this order submitted event, I'm going to go and change my state machine so that it actually has that. So if I get to the state machine, I'm going to split this over here, put the consumer here that's publishing that. I now want to define that the state machine consumes that event. So I'm going to create a public event. An event is a generic type. In this case, I'm going to put order submitted. And I'm going to call it, you know, I don't, I, I always struggle with what to name these because I always just end up calling them the exact same name as the message type. And, you know, it doesn't hurt. It, it seems pretty painless and it works. So I've never really veered from that. It's just it can cause some weirdness, I think, because they're the same name. And I'm going to then come in. And I'm going to say, initially, because this is a state machine, and all state machines start in the initial state. So there's two implicit states that are created for every state machine. One is called initial, and one is called final. The final state is special, because when it's in the final state, you can specify that you want the state machine instance to be removed from the repository. So something to consider is if you finalize a Saga instance, it's going to be removed from the repository if you've specified that option. Now, you don't have to specify that. And I usually create like a terminal state that isn't final because then I can clean up the state machine instances later, either by you know going by date or something like that. In this case, I'm going to create a state called submitted because I want to on a receipt of this event, transition into the submitted state. And now you see why the names get to be so important because you know if I had just called this submitted, then my state would conflict with that. So you know, I don't know. Some people could probably come in and call this like on order submitted, but that just feels weird to me. So I just kind of just roll with it. So initially, and what I want to do here is I want to say when order submitted transition to the submitted state. Oh, yeah. So what I've just defined is the first behavior of the state machine. I've said initially, which a Saga instance that does not exist is in the initial state. So when I'm in the initial state, when order submitted transition to submitted. Now this is an abbreviation, this initially. I could also just say during initial, when, and so on and so forth. But initially just sounds great, looks good. It's all the same signatures, it's just a shortcut. So that's all I'm doing at this point is I'm transitioning to that submitted state. Now events have to be correlated to the state machine instance. Now the order submitted has an order ID, a timestamp, and a customer number. The order ID is the unique identifier for this order, so that's what I want to correlate the event on in the state machine. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to say the event order submitted correlate by ID and in this case, this is basically giving you the message context expression. I'm going to say m.message.orderID. 
And this is going to specify that the GUID of order ID within the order submitted event is what's going to be used to correlate to the Saga instance. And if the instance does not exist in the repo, it's going to create a new one for us. One other piece that I have to wire in, you can see that I'm currently not referencing the current state, is I have to come in here and tell it where the instance state is. And I just do that by saying current state. And because it's a string, it knows how to map to it because it knows how to convert any of these states to the name submitted. And it will store the current state in that property by storing the string submitted. If I wanted to use an integer, let's say I had an integer in here called int, int state. I could also define that this way, but when it's an integer, you actually have to enumerate the valid states. And once you put a state in here, don't change it because zero and one are initial and final, and it's automatically going to let you specify the rest of them. So this would be, you know, state, oh, I'm sorry, zero is none, one is initial, two is final, and three is the rest. So submitted would give me the integer three, some people like their tables to be real tight, and if they're using a SQL database that they want to use an int field for instead of a string, great. It, it, you can do that. You can map it on. It works just fine. You know, We've done it in most of ours because it just keeps the data tighter, and you can do some indices on it. But of course, the selectivity on an index of this nature is near zero, so it makes no sense to put an index on it. But some people like to do that. Great. It's there. I tend to find strings, especially since we're using Redis, to be just fine. So that's what we're going to use. And that's how it's going to work. So at this point, I'm handling one event, order submitted, and I'm transiting to that submitted ID. So I have my order state, which I'm going to go put in my other file. Actually, I'll leave it here for now. Won't, won't clean up the code just yet. And I have the state machine with that behavior. I want to now go to my service which has the startup. And if you remember, the only thing I was doing at that point was adding the consumers from the namespace. Well, now I want to add the Saga, and I want to also configure the Saga repository. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to say, add state machine, Saga state machine. I'm going to put the order state machine. And I think I'm also going to put order state. And that's going to add that registration. I'm also going to say that I want the repository to be the Reddit. Oh, I only have in memory currently. Well, I could use in memory. That would be fun and all. But I really want to use Redis. So I'm going to open up my NuGet package manager. I'm going to go find masstransit.redis. I don't know what these other things are, so don't even think about that. Always look for the package that matches and has the same information, you know, that it's actually published by the actual mass transit build, has the appropriate tags and matches the version you're using. So I'm going to add that. I think that ended pretty quick. Now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say Redis. 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 Figure it out. Dot Redis. I add it to the right service. Why does this feel weird? Oh, no, no, it should just say Redis. Sample.service, sample.service program. Yes. Oh, because <laughs> I did it. Redis repository. How about that? Does that work? You happy about that? Yeah, it's probably a using, but it shouldn't be because it's an extension method. Yeah, it's right there, Redis repository, iSaga registration configure. All of the nice thing about all the mass transit packages is they're all Git linked, so they all pull the source straight from Git. So you can get always get this source with all the comments and everything. It isn't like a decompiled source if your editor has any nice navigation capabilities it gets there. So why is it not finding that? That's a tricky one. ISACA registration configurator. It's in the mass transit namespace. It's an extension off that. ISACA registration configurator order state. 
the type arguments could not be found. Ah, <laughs> okay. This is this is this is where I have to learn a few things. So Redis uses optimistic concurrency, but Redis needs to be versioned saga. I think it is. And because of this, we have to go actually add Redis to our components as well because it's a Redis flag. Oops, what did I do? Don't do that again. Click. So I actually have to go to NuGet and I have to pick that Redis package and I have to go to the entire solution and I have to add that to the components as well because this needs to be a version saga, which comes out of the Redis namespace, because it also needs the property of version, because the version check is done at runtime. So yeah, if you don't have that using there, it really can't figure it out. And of course, extension methods are awesome, but they won't find themselves if you don't tell them where they are. Um, in this case, Redis is running localhost. I sh could configure this as well to where I could say, you know, I could specify a connection factory, which returns a connection multiplexer, or I could just pass a database configuration, which I believe, I believe the way it works with Redis is if you just pass 127.0.0.1, it will resolve it. Um, but again, that's the default. So I'm just going to leave it be. We'll hope it works. So we have the Redis repository. We have the Saga state machine. We're already calling our add hosted service, which is going to configure our endpoints. We're configuring all the endpoints here, which should give us our Saga endpoint. We're using the kebab case formatter, so it should give us an, a queue that's going to listen on that. We're getting our order submitted message in the state machine. I'm just mentally thinking through all these things. We're producing our event. Well, let's try it. Why not, right? So we'll go out here, we'll run our API, and then we'll run our service here. We have mass transit still in debug, so we'll be able to see everything that it does. It looks like we configured a consumer, we configured a Saga, so we have our Saga state machine. We have our exchange name submit order, we have an exchange name order state, we have our order submitted event contract, we have our destination to order state, so the binding was created. And we have our two consumers, one that's on order state and one that's on submit order. So it looks like we're good to go. I think we're going to go look at RabbitMQ. We're just going to verify that everything's in here. We have our order state queue. It has a single consumer on it. Bindings. Bindings. Order state exchange, because we do that. And then there's our order submitted event. So any order submitted event that's published is going to get delivered to our order state. So let's do it. Let's let's go create a queue. Now, this is where I'm going to have to start paying attention because now every time I use a GUID, it's going to then be a matching state machine instance for that. So let's just go ahead and post an order. We're going to try it out. We'll take this GUID that we have here, customer and orders number one, two, three, four, five, and we are going to execute it. We got our response back. We have our order ID. We have our customer name. And if we go out to our code here, yes, we can see where we sent the response. We received the submit order. Our state machine came in and it created an instance based on the order submitted event. That Saga instance ID is right here. We added the instance to the database. And we completed the receive of the message. What happens if we come over here? Does Redis show us what we're doing? I'm not seeing any output from Redis. I don't know how we get that. Um, actually, I do know how we get that, but I don't know if it's going to show it. So it probably won't load that right now. The um, I, I I can try it. I mean, so Rider has a services panel that is actually able to connect to Docker, and it'll tell you what's running. But I don't know if it'll show that Docker Compose because it isn't my project. Oh yeah, there it is. 
So if I go up in here and I load Redis and I look at this, there's the console for Redis. You can see that ready to accept connections, nothing else output. So I guess we'll see if it's there. One way we can find out for sure is we can try to do this again. If we submit the same ID and we execute, that worked. We come out here, this worked. Oh, look, we actually have a problem. We did receive a message. We got the submit order consumer. The submission was accepted. We produced an event. But in this case, whereas before we created and added the Saga state machine, same GUID used, we used an existing site machine, but now we published a fault. And why did we fault? Well, if we look at the fault, we have an error here that says Saga exception on receipt of contracts. So because our state machine has already transitioned to the state of submitted, you can see the message here, the order submitted event is not handled during the submitted state for the order state machine state machine. So rightfully so, the state machine came up and said, hey, you know what? You told me you were submitted, but I already knew that. So it matched to the existing state instance that was already there, but because it had already transitioned to the next state, there wasn't anything for it to do, so it threw it away. Oh, so I can actually go to, let's see here, let's try this, Redis CLI. Is this a work thing? Actually, I don't even know if I have this. Oh, I do. I don't know what collection I'm in, but I can try it. Um, so if I go get that GUID, which is right, where to go? I know that sagas are like prefixed with something in Redis, and I can't remember what it is. Oh, never mind. There it is right there. So you can see we were able to, thanks for that, Drew. Good research. So if we went out to Redis, we can see that that saga is serialized. The current state is submitted. The version is 1, and that's the correlation ID. So our saga is there. I'm going to leave that one up for a second because I want to show us how we're going to fix this. So a word that gets thrown around in event-driven systems a lot is idempotence. Now, in the, in the concept of idempotence is that if you've told me to do something already and I've done it, if you tell me to do it again, I've already done it, so I'm not going to do it again. You know, if I've already taken out the trash, I'm not going to take it out again unless you filled up the trash can again, which you know the odds of that happening are pretty slim. So I've transitioned to submitted. But I don't want to. I don't want to just ignore this because it might be meaningful. Something else may have caused me to get into a state where I no longer want to accept that message. So it may have useful information in it. So right now the saga isn't really storing a whole lot. It's storing a current state and a correlation ID and a version. So let's change that. Let's make it actually store some data. So I'm going to go kill a couple things here. Actually, I don't have to kill my front end. I just have to kill the back end service. And let's go into our stop saga here again and look. So initially, when the order is submitted, we're going to transition to submitted. Let's add some state. Let's store the customer number. You know, that might be something useful to know. So we're going to add the customer number as a property here. And because we're using Redis, we don't have to do a database migration, which is why I used Redis in this example. And I'm going to add another statement here. I'm going to say then. And then is one of the predicates that you can use within an event handler in the state machine, which just executes synchronously. If you're doing async, then you're going to want to use then async because it returns a task. And it, you're given a context on the input. So in this case, I want to say context.instance for the saga instance dot customer number equals context dot and autonomous calls it data instead of message because the state machines are, are built outside of mass transit. So context dot data dot customer number. I want to copy the customer number from the incoming message context dot data to the instance and store that with the saga state. This is something I want to keep around. And let's add one more thing in here too. Why not? Let's add a date time of updated. 
which would be the last time that it was updated. I don't know, why not, right? It's something that we would be generating. In this case, we probably want to convert this to a statement. We want to say context.instance.updated equals datetime.etc now. So now we can set the number and we can set the time we were updated. I don't know why I would do that. It just seemed like a fun thing to do. I also might want to have the context.instance.submit date equals context.data.timestamp, which the timestamp the order was submitted is what I want to store. So we'll add that as well. We'll just make it an auto property. And now I have the submit date. I guess I'll move the version up here so that it gets out of my way. So now I have updated, which is when it was last updated. I have the submit date of the order, and I have a customer number. And you know I'm going to like move these around until I'm happy with the ordering. Now I can initialize those values when the order is submitted. But if I'm already in the submitted state, I might not want to blow up and cause an error in my error log and publish a fault message, which I should probably go over errors. That would be a really useful piece of information to cover. But I'll get into that in the next episode so we can finish this out. So what I can do is I can say during submitted, when order submitted, well, I've already been there, so I'm not going to do anything. So I'm just going to say dot, or actually I'm not going to say ignore, but I'm not going to do anything. So in this case, I'm actually just going to say ignore. And this will just say that, you know what, that message can come in. I'm going to ignore it because I've already processed it because otherwise I wouldn't be in submitted. And I'll show why that's significant later. If I run out of time, I talk about it another time. But I could just put a win with an empty expression, but that, that doesn't really convey intent very well. If I had a order accepted event, which I'll probably add later, the order accepted event would jump straight to accepted because an order accepted event can only happen in my business after the order's already been submitted. Messages are never guaranteed to, re to be processed in order. And if I receive the accepted event after I've received the submitted event, it's not a big deal. There's useful information in the submitted event, like the submit date, that isn't going to be in the order accepted event, which would just have an accept date. So when you think about the states as a timeline, I'm never going to go back in time on a state machine. I'm never going to say, oh, I was in the order accepted state, but now I'm just going to go back to submitted because the, or the order has already been accepted. If anything, if I received the order submitted event later, I'm just going to take the information that's useful out of it, and I'm not going to change state at that point. I'll stay in whatever state I'm in at that point. And there is an expression for that as well called during any. And so what I could say is if during any event I receive a submitted, then all I'm going to do, oh, sorry, during any, when submitted, oh, sorry, see, this is why the naming messes with my head sometimes, then, and I'm only going to copy that submit date and that customer number. I'll just take this code from here. I'm not going to do the updated because I'll just say that I want to. And I'll copy that data, but I'm not going to change state at this point. Now, the interesting thing about during any, it never, during any never includes the initial or the final states, but any other state defined would be included. So, and thanks for that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, understanding the events and the additional wins and why states happen and why messages error. That's one of the very common questions that I get. So that's, that's why I'm going into this is because messages are never guaranteed to be in order. So you have to be able to understand when they can come out of order. So the order submitted during any, all I'm going to do is copy the submit date because I know it's going to be in that event. I'm going to make sure I get the customer number if I don't have it. And I could even do something fancy now that we have cool C sharp eight is I could actually do this and I could just say set the language version to latest because I haven't done that yet. 
but I could also just come in and say if those haven't been set, well, there isn't a null for that date time. I should probably actually go do that. These should be nullable. Because they aren't nullable by default. Yeah, so now I could actually come in and say, hey, if these don't have a value, then go ahead and initialize them to that value. And that shouldn't break any dirty tracking that anything's doing. So now anytime I get an order submitted out of band, it's going to do that. So let me save that. Let me go out and restart my service. I think I have to restart the web too because I killed it. And now if I go back to this UI that still has the same GUID in it and call execute again, I'll get the response back. I get the undocumented 202. But if I go out here, I see that it was used, but nothing was changed. So now instead of getting that error, it used the existing Saga instance, but because it wasn't there, because it was already there, it should have updated it though, because I did get more information this time and I added those fields. So now you can see the version is two because it incremented the version, the current state is submitted, and the customer number has been added as well as the submit date. Now it is going to take the new submit date since I resubmitted that order, but you know, it can't all be perfect. We could get there, but right now we aren't. So, so that's a lot. That's um, We now have a Saga. It's being stored in Redis. It's running on our services endpoint. It has the data that it is getting from that event, and it's captured. Subsequent events, which would be like replays or whatever, are being sent to that. There is, sorry, there is the idea that this could have issues, though. There could be errors. Um, okay, let's see. Question How do you finalize a consumer saga? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know that you necessarily can finalize it because it isn't. It isn't something that I know how. I think there's a method in it. It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know how you tell a saga to be deleted in a consumer saga. I mean, it's literally been probably 10 years since I've used one. So I really don't know. I would have to look. Yeah, I understand what you mean by being final removed from the database. Question in the chat is like, how do you finalize a consumer saga or can you? And I'm like, I mean, I'm like stump the chump. I got no clue. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how you do that. I mean, the repository, how is the repository going to know? It's a good question. Does it even say? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if I don't know, I don't know that I would try. There is a way to tell it that it's done, but I can't remember what it is. I, I for the life of me, cannot remember how you tell it, how it's done. How you tell one to delete? I, I don't know, because it was code that I put in for mass, for autonomous that looks at it once it's processed and calls remove. But it has to be telling it to remove it somehow because it's implemented in every Saga repository, and the Saga repositories aren't coupled to autonomous. So, yeah, so that's an interesting question. We could figure that out, but I don't want to go sideways here. So, because we have a lot more to do here, and I think we're already like forty five minutes in, so it's going to be a long one. So now that I have this cool order submission saga, I want to I want to I want to beef up my request client. I want to be able to go to the website and get the status of my order. So now it's time to like put some of this cool processing technology to work. So I'm going to go to my order controller and I'm going to finally add the one missing method that, you know, probably should have been here in the beginning is get so I'm going to say, let's see here, we're going to get an I action result back because I have no idea what it's going to be. We're going to call it get, and we're going to pass it an ID. And I know that you're supposed to do like weird markup in these tags, but it seems to be working, so I'm not going to complain about it. But what I want to do is I want to have the ability to get check an order. You know, it's like, hey, I want to check my order. What's up with it? You know, what's going on? So because I'm going to interact with, I don't want to go talk to the database because I don't own it. I mean, this, you know, the database order state is off in some other microservice. I use the word microservice. I feel really complete now and compliant. It's off in some other service. It's going to be 
I shouldn't be talking to its database. Integration at the database layer is like, you know, the, the seventh level of hell whenever you try to figure out 10 years later what's been going on. So I really want to be able to interact with that saga because that saga is my state of my order and I want to be able to talk to it. So I'm going to go to my contracts and I'm going to start creating some more message contracts because we love message contracts. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to hit add and I'm going to go to class and I'm going to go to interface and I'm going to create a class called check order. And all I'm going to put in here is an order ID. That's all I need. I could put a timestamp, but what's the point really? Yeah. One of the things that's, that I didn't mention about the requests earlier when I was doing the request for the submit order is typically a submit order is something that you wouldn't want to expire. And the request client puts a default time to live on requests of like 30 seconds. You can change it, but in this case, it's going to make a lot more sense because the UI, the, or I'm sorry, the API endpoint is going to send the request to check the order to get a response. But if the if the user disconnects or it times out or whatever, it isn't the end of the world. It doesn't contain some piece of information that we would expect to stick around. Whereas our submit order, you'll notice in the put version of it, we never time out. It's a guaranteed message. There is no time to live on it. And I didn't grab that from the queue and show it to you, but that was kind of the point. It's like typically your your commands, like a submit order, you're going to want to send those. Those are not something that you would put a time out on, but because how we worked into that through the request client, that's how we got there with that time out. So just something to kind of clarify that. What is my response going to be for a check order? Well, let's see. What should it be? Let's just call it order state. No, let's not call it order state. We already have an order state. Let's call it something else. Shall we? Let's call it um, order status. Yeah, because that's so much less overloaded. We will put our order ID in here. That did not make sense. And we'll just put a string in here for state. For now, that looks good. Actually, we'll even put the customer number in there. Why not? We have it. Should we give it to them? Could be PHI or PII that we don't want to disclose, so maybe not. We'll put that in our order status. And now we'll go back to our controller. So we have the ID. We're going to need a request client, which we're going to have to register within our startup. So we're going to go to startup. We're going to add another request client. We're going to call it check order. And I'm not going to wire this one up. I mean, I showed you how you can do that. I'm just going to let it publish this out. And so this is where it gets funny because in a lot of the systems that I've built, you know, check order seems like a command to me and it makes good sense from a request. So I'm going to leave it the way it is. But if you were actually trying to do something to the state machine, like, like, say cancel it i would call this something like order cancellation requested with the details in and the reason being is i'm requesting the order to be canceled but if the order was already shipped cancellation isn't really an option unless you're you know amazon and they can afford to eat the cost and just tell you not to ship it back in which case you know that's great for you but typically i would you know anything where i'm trying to do an event that would initiate a change in state, I would give it a name that is like a request or you know, acknowledge or something like that. So in this case, we're just here. We're just going to go with check order. So I added the request client to that. I'm going to let it publish it because I don't want to go looking for it right now and figure out the endpoint address. With conductor, it will discover those endpoint addresses, but that doesn't work with sagas yet, so we aren't going to jump into that. Um, now I'm going to go back to my controller. And I'm going to add yet another dependency. And this one I'm going to call it check order. It's going to be the check order client. And within my get, I'm going to then say their response equals check order client dot get response. The response I'm looking for is order status. And I'm going to pass in the order. Oh, I'm just going to use the wizard because it's so awesome. <laughs> ID. Oh, I forgot the await. So I'm going to await the response. 
and then I'm going to return OK response.message, and I'm just going to stream out the result. Ideally, I would create a view model and map to that, but hey, you know, we're going to just go with what's in there because we're trying to keep it simple here. You don't need 18 layers just to show how all this stuff plays nicely together. So I've added a get. I can pass it the GUID. I'm going to have to capture that GUID that I saved before I go and reset that page because I'm going to have to reset the Swagger UI. So where is that GUID? Because I want that one that I already have. I'm going to copy that out. I'm going to try not to clear my clipboard. I'm saved. I'm going to go out here. This is my website. So I'm going to restart the website with the new client. Oh, but it isn't going to do anything because I haven't written any logic yet, have I? Yeah, I haven't actually updated the saga to do anything yet. So that's fun. So our request would time out. We'll save yourself 30 seconds of watching that and get to work. So we're going to go back to our state machine now. And now we're going to handle a new event. In this case, the event is going to be order check order. And this is we're just going to call this like order check so it'll have a different name. Order I'm going to just I'm going to call it order status requested because why not just change it and make it crazy. So Again, during any, our good friend, because we don't care what state it is, but when the order status is requested, what are we going to do? We're going to respond. Respond. And we're going to respond async because sending a message is an asynchronous task. And we're going to say, and this is the one that's hard to find because generic overloads get insane if you don't do this very often init and what is my thing called order status new what does that need that for oh because i hadn't actually referenced mass transit anywhere in here that's so funny add missing properties order id state so this is going to be x dot instance dot correlation id and this is going to be x.instance.currentState. That looks great. I'm going to send a response, and it's going to get there. I like it. It's a good plan. It's the goal. All right, so now I'm going to respond to an order state requested with an order status, and if I'm in any state. Cool. I like it. So now I have some behavior. Let's go compile our service and see if our website actually runs it. I'm going to recopy this because I'm sure I lost my clipboard by now. I'm going to refresh this page. Ooh, I have a get. Oops, that doesn't sound good. Uh, <laughs> what do we do? 8,000 line stack trace. Ooh, the state machine was not properly configured. Order status requested was not specified. Oh, interesting. Order status requested was not specified. So let's go look at our code. What do we have here? We have order status requested. It's an event. Oh, we didn't specify it because it doesn't know how to correlate it. Let's add the correlation ID in there. We're good to go. Now it'll work. Famous last words. All right, looks good. And what do you bet I lost my grid? What do you bet? What do you bet it's gone? Ah, there it is, sweet. Response, I got a response. I got a 200. Oh, look at this. I got an order and it's in a state of submitted. Legit, how awesome is that? If I go out here, I can see that my state machine instance was used. Somewhere, order state, check order, sample order state. Where is the used? Uh, is that the web or the service? Huh, I don't have a message for that, but I should. Let's try this again. What's the message that I get? That's the receive. 
Oh, there it is. Saga used. I just missed it the first time. So it was there. I just missed it. But you'll see in the actual debug log that that instance, that GUID, was it used an existing instance, and then it sent to the response endpoint a response of order status, which then had that data in there. So that's cool. What if I did it wrong? What if 79 turned into 7a? Yeah. That's bad. Seems like uh, I'm going to hang my UI now because the order ID is invalid. Sometimes if I go over here, is this the right instance? Yeah, so it looks like check order, order state, didn't use anything, it called receive. It looks like absolutely nothing happened. I don't have it used at all. I don't even see that identifier anywhere. So yeah, so what happened here? Well, we received the message, but it just threw it away. And, you know, I, I'll stop the dramatic pause of like, oh my gosh, what happened? So if the message correlates to an instance and the instance doesn't handle it, it doesn't match to an existing instance, what does it do? It threw it away because it didn't match to an existing instance. So that's bad. We probably don't want to do that. So let's go in here. But is it a big deal? I mean, if they ask for something that doesn't exist, technically our API should return a not found. So let's tweak this a little bit. Let's change this statement here. And let's say x dot, oh my gosh, there's an on missing instance. In this case, what are we going to do? We're going to... We're going to do an actual execute async because we want to add a method that we're going to run here and we're going to take the context because all we have is the message so basically we're writing an inline message consumer here we're basically able to create an async method that does a few things and in this case we're going to say if context.request id has value and let's go ahead and tell them that we don't have anything so we'll say context.respondAsync. We'll throw an await in here because we're good. We'll create a new thing called order not found, and we'll pass it context.message.orderID. Sounds good enough to me. We'll go to where our check order is. We'll just create a new interface here called order not found. And then we'll go back to our controller, not our controller base, that's crazy. And instead of doing like we do here, we'll change it again. We'll rename this to found, or we'll rename this to status. And then we'll say status comma not found, because we don't want to throw an exception. I mean, an order not found is totally a legitimate thing. You know, it's a, it's a business condition. It might have been accepted and just not been processed in the state machine yet. I mean, there's, there's a million things that could be going on here. So we can just say if status dot if completed successfully, then return OK status dot message. Response equals await status. I wish there was a better way to write this. One of these days I'll figure it out. Otherwise, we know that we're going to get a not found, so we'll await it just to be nice to .NET, and then we're going to return not found. And we're just going to say new. Uh, I guess we can return the I feel so bad that I do an else just so I don't have to change, pick a different variable name. I'm so pathetic in that respect. And I'll just return the message that came back because it might have a reason or in there, or, you know, something else. Who knows? Who cares? So now I've changed this get so that it has two different conditions that it can handle. So my service is running. My website, I'm going to run again. Hopefully it works. I guess it did. Uh, and then we're going to come back in here. We're going to execute this again. And now I get a 404 not found. <laughs> 
my order was not found and there's the order ID. So it's actually processing. The state machine is actually able to respond with a, hey, that was great, but I'm just gonna do what you told me to do in that method. And in this case, it called send on the response because there was a request ID and it sent the order not found message. So now I actually created a business response to the fact that a Saga instance was missing. So that's a lot, that's kind of fun, but now I'm able to check the status on an order. So I can do a put, pass it the GUID, because again, I'm assigning the order ID as part of my put. So I expect that that order ID will be how I reference it in the future. So that when I call get on that GUID, I'm able to actually get that response or get an order not found. Hmm, what else is there? If I go back into this thing and actually copy this ID and go create one with that ID and customer number rank 13, except that's rank 12 for me. Now we get a 202. And now if I take that exact same ID, come back up here again, now I get the 200 and I see that the order state has been submitted. If I go back here and look at that, that works. And because this, because I'm actually using Redis, um, I can go and start up more instances of my service. Because the Saga repository is persistent. And I can ask either one of these. Let's see here. I can ask either one of these, and they're just going to bounce back and forth, being able to retrieve that Saga state and load it in. Because Redis is shared between the two instances, doesn't matter which instance gets the message, they both process it. So that's a saga. That's how we pass the events. That's how we capture the events. That's how we store the data in Redis. That's how we query back to that saga to do things. Future topics in this will probably be some scheduling and handling subsequent events and all sorts of fun stuff. And I know there was a request to hear how courier and routing slips work. So maybe we'll make our order kick off a routing slip that then feeds back and submits events back to that same order state. That would be fun. I mean, it's only nine o'clock central time. I mean, you know, what time do I have to go to sleep? I could probably crank another one of these out, but we'll see. Um, but anyway, that's it. That's Sagas. Hopefully that was useful. Um, appreciate you know, the comment and the questions as we go along. It makes it a lot of fun when people are here versus watching it later. So glad you were able to show up. Um, a lot to cover today. We got a service started up. I will eventually put this code out on GitHub so that you can play along. I might post it. If I do, it'll be on the mass transit repo. It'll be called, or I might put it in the Fatboy G repo. And it'll be sample Twitch. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in. I'm sure I'll do, if I don't do more tonight, I'll probably do a few more tomorrow to kind of build out the, the career routing slip stuff and kind of show how that correlates in. But uh, appreciate it. Thanks. Have a good evening.